Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Bill. Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we're going to be breaking down the Bears' final preseason game and get a little bit into roster talk and week one talk. Uh, we're going to be talking about this week of Cubs, this week of White Sox, maybe a little more. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today at family-friendly, affordable prices. Sure, the season is going, isn't going on right now, but it'll be starting up soon enough. So head on over to icehogs.com, get yourself a hat, shirt, jersey, tickets, and more. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Alex, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing all right. How about yourself? I'm doing okay. We are we are having other than those like hundred degree days, we are having some beautiful Chicago summer weather here. Yeah, and you know, last night was uh, our block party, and me and my old uh, neighborhood buddies, we always get together for that for a bonfire. And you could not have asked for a better night. And we were all joking, saying there is no way in hell we'd have a bonfire on Wednesday or Thursday. I mean, it sucked being outside for like five seconds those days. Oh yeah, it was brutal, absolutely brutal. Uh, I didn't, I did not leave my house on Wednesday or Thursday at all. Sat in the AC. Well, you know what's crazy is it was either Wednesday, one of the hot days. I was at the gym kind of late that night, so I was coming home at like nine thirty, and I'm looking at my dashboard, and at nine thirty at night, it was still like ninety five degrees on the dashboard. It was reading, so it's like. Holy crap, even when the sun is well gone down, it's still in the mid 90s in temperature. It, it was it was nuts. And then you get these past few days. I mean, today there wasn't a cloud in the sky. I went on like a 3-hour walk around town. It was great. Yeah, today was just absolutely amazing. You couldn't have asked for better, really. No, no, you couldn't. Um, I was happy about that. And, you know, this this summer, to be honest, has been pretty, pretty amazing weather. It has. We've been pretty lucky. You know, we've had a few spells of rain, but it's not been like overly extended. There were a few dry spells where you wish you could have gotten some rain. But then, you know, I'd say over the past two months, we had those short spurts of a lot of rain where it was kind of sufficient with the plants and the trees and whatnot. And then you had a lot of nice weather in between. Um, I was at the Cubs game last week against the Royals and it was steamy, but it wasn't like overly terrible, like Wednesday, Thursday. And it just kind of makes you think like, okay, Wednesday, Thursday for around here was kind of an anomaly. It's like, we haven't had a ton of days where it's been like 95 plus degrees. Yeah, I thought it was going to be hot, like at that Cubs game, because I was at the game too. And we had uh, shaded seats and we had a breeze. And I was like, oh my God, when we went out into the sun, it was brutal. But actually, during the game where our seats were, I could not have asked for a nicer day. Yeah, being in the shade for me, too, in the upper deck was nice. It's like when you walked out and you were actually in the sun, you're like, oh, shit, this is kind of hot. But, you know, when you were in the shade, it was perfectly fine. Um. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the, like, especially with the breeze. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> being by the lake helps. Uh, all right. Where do you want to start? You want to start bears? Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, sure. Because when we get to the baseball, I've, I want to. Maybe this will be fun. Maybe this won't, but I want to introduce something um, maybe that you're already introduced to in its old hat. But um, let's talk a little bears first. Uh, get this out of the way. Um, 
that was not a fun game against the Bills. No, uh, it, it wasn't. Flat it, out wasn't. It's it's a combination of a lot of things. One, this team did not play its starters enough during preseason to be in regular season form. And I get that, you know, last year you dealt with a ton of injuries and you're already dealing with injuries. But if players don't play, they don't get into game readiness. And we start off, we don't start off with some schlub team. This isn't, this isn't like college football where, you know, the big, the big powerhouse schools get to play nobody teams the first couple of weeks and run up 73 to nothing scores. That's not how it is in the NFL. The bears have Packers week one. We're, we're less than two weeks away from bears Packers week one. And the Packers have looked awfully good this preseason. I know it's preseason, but you know, whether or not you think Jordan love is good or not, that defensive line versus our offensive line, I don't know. Yeah, I, I I totally get it. And, you know, I I feel like the, the lack of playing our guys is, is going to bite us in the ass. Remember when it did under Matt Nagy? Yeah. And because, you know, frankly, I saw a team in, in week three of preseason look like it was week one of preseason. Yeah, it was, it's just absolutely you know, frustrating because these, these guys got to get, you know, the offensive line, especially they need to play together. They need to gel. And I know guys are injured and guys are nursing, you know, ailments and bruised egos and whatnot, but you know, they get a big challenge week one. That's a, that's a must win game right out of the gate, right out of the gate. It's a must win. You are against the, your biggest rival who have kicked, the shit out of you for 30 years and they're coming to your house when confident and prepared yeah they are they are ready to go and who knows maybe maybe when faced with a real defense not a vanilla defense where they're they're disguising blitzes and dropping guys into coverage from the defensive line and you know blitzes from exotic blitzes maybe jordan love sucks but, you know, regardless, that defensive line doesn't suck. And, and here's, here's, yeah, it, sorry, go on. Yeah, and it's, they're going to be coming at you. And if they, if they come at you ready to play and the Bears offensive line looks like it did against Buffalo, Justin Fields is going to have a long fucking day. Here's what bothers me too on the defensive side is I don't think Jordan Love has to be spectacular to beat the Bears. You know how you're going to beat the Bears? Dinking and dunking them to death. The way I see it, and maybe this will be wrong in the regular season, I could be very wrong here, but I get a sense that the plan against the Bears defense is just going to dink and dunk you to death. You're going to run up the middle. You're going to do short passing plays, screens, whatever. You're going to get the ball out quickly. I think the Bears are better equipped to shut down the deep pass, the long play, because I do like our secondary. But if you're not putting enough pressure on the quarterback and they're able to get that ball out quickly and you don't really have a defensive line to stop the run, then remember what you saw? And then that Buffalo opening drive, how many times did they get to third down? Yeah, it's... And they, they couldn't stop them. I mean... If if I were the head coach of the Packers, my my scheme on offense would be run, 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 short pass, short pass. Yes. Don't turn the ball over. Play field position and let your defense do the work. Yep. I agree. I that's that's how that's how they're gonna beat this team. And look, I, I don't think the Bears. Uh, and maybe, maybe in a few weeks when things are more gelled and they've actually got more reps under their belt, maybe the offense opens up and they're able to be more explosive. But if, but week one, you're going to see so much rust and, and 
guys not being ready that you're going to see we're going to have to take abuse from the Packer fans again and Jordan mm-hmm. Love's not going to have to do shit to win. Yeah. Kind of like that uh week 2 game last year against the Packers. Aaron Rodgers didn't really air it out or do anything overly special. They just game managed and they still won. I I mean that's you, you remember 2019 that opening game when they didn't prepare in preseason and you, we lost 10 10 to 3. Yep. I mean I, I just the other the other thing that I want to really hammer home here is if the offense was fresh looking great and the defense wasn't looking that great. That's that's kind of okay, right? Because we know that either way, going into the season, it wasn't going to be a Super Bowl season. But at least if you established a great offense and Justin Fields looks like your future quarterback, you would take it. If you were losing games 41 to 38, okay. I mean, you don't want to lose a lot of games this year, but you'd be more accepting of it if you were looking more competitive. But, I mean, can we just be real? Just fully honest. Justin Fields did not look good on Saturday at all. I'm going to preface this by saying is the numbers did not look good. The offense just looked stagnant. Uh, There was a throw to DJ Moore that was a little low. He should have caught it. He should have caught it. Khalil Herbert got one right in his hands. Could Justin Fields have put a little more touch on it and not rifled it? Yes. But it hit Khalil Herbert in the hand. That should have been caught. Yes. You should have been caught. There was another one. Komet dropped that he was a little late. Still should have been caught. All right. You know, guys, guys got to make these plays too. But, you know, Justin Fields, did he look awful? I'm not going to say that. Did, did he look ready to play like a regular season game? No. And, you know, that it was more of those throws to the back shoulder that should have been made that I didn't particularly. And again, I know it's preseason. I'm not trying to ride too much into this, but you know, which ones I'm talking about. I mean, they were tightly defended, but you know, you have a better chance that the chance he threw to the end zone, you throw that to the back shoulder that has a good chance of getting caught. At least a better chance. Yeah, there was the the other one to DJ Moore that where he was just blanketed, and I kind of felt like that could have been PI, but whatever. Oh, agree. But and I don't, I'm now I don't care in preseason, whatever. Right. I let them let them be handsy, get used to it, so you can learn to play with it. Um, but you know that the placement of that ball was, you know, probably ninety percent knockdown, ten percent interception if if he throws it but over the shoulder between the the offensive player in the end zone there's no chance of interception unless you get one of those fluke things where it just pops out of somebody's hands right and in the air but you know it's either you know the vast majority of the time it's either a 50 50 ball where that the receiver comes down with or it's an incomplete pass give give your guy the opportunity to to win those 50, 50 balls. So yeah, that wasn't a great throw, but I don't, I don't know if he actually really thought he was going to complete that. Um, it just, the offense just seemed out of whack. And I think it's just because you're, you're not playing together in a real meaningful game. I I just, I wonder if Matt Aberflus overvalued the joint practice with the Colts a little bit. Yeah, you had a joint practice, which are nice. I like joint practices, even if it's against so a bad I. team, but you can't overvalue it when it's against a bad team. It's an NFL team. team regardless. Yeah, but it's a bad NFL team. It's a bad NFL team that, you know, uh, they're they're not ready to compete either. And and then part of it was the Bills looked like they were in pre, pre uh, regular season form. They were playing pretty hard. They I mean, were. They, they, I mean, the Justin Fields took a shot. Like, um, they, they were said, okay, play. that's enough. <laughs> yeah. They're, they were ready to play. The bears weren't. And that should tell you a whole lot about, uh, about, you know, the, the preparedness. And I, I'm not going to beat up Flus because I, I really like Flus and I'll talk in a few minutes about a story that makes me like him even more. I think he's a good head coach. It's, but 
he needs to learn that if you baby the players that you're probably more likely to get them injured go out there let those guys play if a yeah, guy I gets agree. injured playing hard and getting ready for the season that sucks but get the next man up and ready to play where we guys didn't play at all and you're seeing you're seeing injuries right right and you know what like again do i give a shit about the final score of a preseason game no it's it's all in the tape and not in the box score i mean cuz you can look at things that possible new qb2 tyler bagent did you could look at the numbers but if you look at what he actually did you know the numbers could have looked a hell lot better did you say possible number two? Yeah, because I mean, is he going to be number two or number three? I now mean, that PJ Walker's gone, PJ Walker's gone. I mean, is it? I mean, is it possible that they're going to keep? Uh, what's his face? Peterman, Nathan Peterman. I don't know. I think Bajan's a uh, lock at number two. I I mean, I think that it's. It spoke volumes when, as soon as they took Fields out, it was all Tyler Bajan after that. Yeah, I'm, you know, I thought maybe P, uh, P.J. Walker, you know, struggling to learn the offense a little bit. Maybe practices were better. Apparently, practices weren't better because they jettisoned him today. They did, yep, they did, about an hour ago from when we were recording this. and And Alex Leatherwood. Yeah, that was a little more surprising to me. That one surprised me because they they moved him into guard and he looked like he was playing pretty good, found his spot. And I was like, all right, you know, he's not he's not competing for a starting job here, but the backup role, you know, with him and Jatire Carter, they're like, okay, I feel pretty confident with those backup guards make me feel pretty good and they cut him and I was a little shocked because you know from what I've seen I thought you saw a much improved player and I have not seen a single news media person talk about the threat of him being cut or not even making the team. I mean, every single prediction of what the final 53 is going to look like had Alex Leatherwood on that final 53. Yeah. And I think I had him on mine too. If I remember correctly, I thought I did, but. Oh, I did too. Absolutely. You know, I had him as, as, you know, a potential, you know, starter. If somebody was injured, like, Oh, like a legit, not end of the bench backup, like, primary backup so i i don't know if if it's a hey he's getting paid a lot of money um and they are just like you know not a lot but i think five million uh and they're just like nah we don't want to pay that we we prefer some other guys or the um or they just didn't feel he could play. I have no idea. See, they're no not strapped for cash, so they're able to do this sort of thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're not strapped for cash, but they're clearly, you know, ma- like, you know, they're making moves and, they, you know, who cares what the player makes? They're going to make their moves. And so I mm-hmm. don't know what their their opinion of Alex Leatherwood is. And it's a little shocking, um, especially with so many injuries across the offensive line. I, I I would not be making early cuts on anything. Yeah, that's why that one was a bit surprising. PJ Walker was not, you know, I thought that, okay, they're probably going to keep him because they gave him a two-year deal, but we never said, hey, there's no way they're not going to keep him. But I think after the preseason game where we saw Tyler Bajan and not PJ Walker, it's like, okay, that you could see that more coming now. and, And sure enough, we did. Yeah, I, you know, it was a little bit, I mean, it was a little surprising, not shocking, but a little surprising. Um, I didn't think it was out of the realm of possibility, but I thought that Bajent maybe did enough to make himself QB2, um, but they would keep P.J. Walker as a veteran. But I, that goes yeah. to the Peter man. I mean, I, who knows if he makes it either? Yeah, I don't know. You know, if he does... I would 
almost guarantee he's going to be practice squad. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to carry without PJ Walker. I don't think they're going to carry three quarterbacks on the roster. Yeah, no, I could see that. And I think that uh, there's not going to be the threat of losing Nathan Peterman going to the practice squad. So, yeah. And, you know, I know people debated about, well, you could put Tyson Paget on on waivers and then bring him back. Oh, someone practice. would pick him up. Someone is, would absolutely pick him up. You know, in the, the pickup thing is they would have to pick him up and put him on their 53 man roster. Now, are there a lot of teams that would pick him up, put him on the 53. Probably not, but it just takes one team. It takes right. one team to look at him and say, you know what? We we're, we're confident we could carry three quarterbacks. Cause I think roughly half the league carried three quarterbacks last year. Mm -hmm. So a team carrying three quarterbacks, there's any of those teams that are willing to keep th three quarterbacks are going to look and be like, is he better than our number three quarterback? And do we feel like he could improve from there? If the answer is yes, you take him and put him on as your third QB. And there's going to be at least one team willing to do that. Or at least I'm not confident enough to say, to say there isn't, um, you know, if, if, if it was, if you were only allowed to have two QBs, then I'd feel a lot more confident and putting him on making him the practice squad. But here's the thing is if he doesn't have to accept putting him on the practice squad with the bears, once he's waived, he could go to somebody else's practice squad. If he wanted, he, he's waived. Right. Exactly. And most teams or most players, you know, tend to, because they're like, Oh, well, I know the coaching staff. I know the system. I know what's expected of me. I know this routine and it's the same money on practice squad, but so why wouldn't I go back to a place where they liked me enough to bring me back? Uh, but it, he's not obligated. Right. Right. You know, if, if a, let's say the Falcons were like, yeah, we would like to bring in our practice squad. You looked at that roster and you're like, I don't think Ty, uh, Desmond Ritter is very good. And I think, I think if I work hard in there, I could win that job on that roster and maybe even start. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I go to Atlanta, if, you know, as a practice squad. But this way, you keep him. If you like him and you think he is a guy that can grow, you keep him. And you know, did I see enough of him to be like, oh yeah, this dude's a fucking stud? No, but I saw enough good things from him that I don't want him to leave for nothing. Right. And and the thing about the NFL is. You want to keep talent in your building. And I think he's talented enough at, a, at the most important position. If this was a guy that was at that same type of level and it was an inside linebacker, I would be like, I'll risk it. But QB is the most important position in the NFL. And if you feel that you've got the, you, you know, have a lottery ticket that that might be, that might be paying out, then why would you, why would you get rid of it? Right. No, I'm, I'm 100% with you, 100% with you. And I think this is the right call because like I said before, we don't truly know what Tyson Bajant will be in the NFL in like actual NFL, you know, play, you know, we don't know. It, it could be, it could be overhyped preseason stuff, but you know, there's, there's that potential ceiling that may or may not be there versus what we already know we have in PJ Walker. One thing I can say for a fact is that Tyson Bajan is better than Trey Lance. Ooh, that whole thing. That was a disaster. And, you know, if you listen to old school scouts and, and maybe thinking he's changed, maybe somebody just over you know, made a, an executive decision, but typically they like to see a lot of passes. And that was a big criticism of the, the pick of Mitchell Trubisky is he didn't play a lot. There was minimal experience and minimal time to grow. And in the NFL, it's hard to go from a guy that didn't play a lot to the NFL and then grow there. It's way too fast, way too competitive. 
and way too demanding to just grow like that. And, you know, I don't think Mitch Trubisky is a, is a awful player. It's just not a franchise quarterback. He's not a franchise quarterback. And maybe things could have been different had he, had he been a starter for four years and got, a, you know, develop better habits not played worked, under and, Matt Nagy and worked through kinks in college and then came out and in a better system and, uh, and was able to grow. Maybe, maybe things could have been different. I still don't think he was a franchise player, but maybe things could have been different. Maybe he could have been an Alex Smith type. Sure. Uh, and where you were, you were good enough to be a starter, but people always looking a little bit down the road going, all right, Who's our, who is he going to bridge us to, uh, but never, never played bad enough where you, you know, wanted to yank him out until you got the, one of the best quarterbacks of all time. Uh, but you know, Trey Lance did not play. He played less than Trubisky, I think. And he He lost much less than Trubisky. Uh, I mean, what did Trubisky have 15 games and 17 games in college? And I don't know how many Trey Lance had, but it was not many. And he missed an entire season because of COVID. And he, I was just like, woof. When they picked him, when he, they were talking about top 10 picks, I, woof. You know, he had in college, there was a lot of good things that you saw, a lot of tools. But to pick a guy from North Dakota State that high and that trade that much up to get him, Right, that it's 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 like the Ryan Pace trading up to get Trubisky when he really didn't have to, and I mean this was an even bigger haul. Like if Trey Lance was a project that the 49ers took later in the draft, I think everyone would be like, okay, that's a smart move. The 49ers are a smart organization and they know how to you know figure things out. I mean, you know, they still could have maybe if he didn't get hurt, but. When he was drafted where he was and the assets they gave up to get there, that was so much more of a riskier project. Because if you draft him later on and you try to risk it and it doesn't work, okay, you're not going to throw everything away. Where this, you like, okay, the 49ers are still going to be a contender, but you can't help but wonder what you could have been had you not given up that much capital. It was it was always when that draft pick was made, that was seriously one of the riskiest moves I we've seen in a draft in a while. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and yeah, what you gave up for him and you know, ever the Bears were oh, John Lynch, they he finessed Ryan Pace and he's a genius. And then oof, a couple years later, this this is this was a bad move. And you know. Luckily, he's got a body of work of putting together a good team because that could that gets people fired. Oh, yeah. I mean, the fact that what they've been to back to back NFC championships the past two years now. I mean, you're lucky you got that. You know, you're lucky you have such a good foundation around you. I mean, if you put an elite quarterback on that 49ers team, I guarantee you the 49ers have a Super Bowl over the past few years. Guarantee it. Oh, if they, I mean, in that QB friendly system, if if they would have traded for Aaron Rodgers, you know, him him going back home as a Game Northern over. California kid and playing in that system, the Eagles would be like, what the fuck? Yeah. That's uh that would have been something. Um before we jump back into the game, there's there's a rumor that was popping up that I, right off the bat, I was just like, nope, no chance. This is this is lazy sports writing. It was Jonathan Taylor being linked to the Chicago Bears. Yeah, th- yeah. There especially when the the Colts were talking about what compensation they want for him. They want a first round pick zero chance. The bears are going to give a first round pick t- for Jonathan Taylor. And there there's just no chance. And then paying him on top of that. 
Like he's a really good football player. There's no chance you're trading assets, future assets to get him. And then also uh, giving him, you know, 12, $15 million a year. Not going to happen. No, it was ridiculous for a running. When you have so many other holes on your roster. And, and listen, I'm not comparing David Montgomery with Jonathan Taylor, but uh, David Montgomery was a guy well liked by the organization. He played hard, was a draft pick of the team. They would have loved to have given him some, some money to come back and stay with the team. And they were not willing to budge and pay him $6 million. Like they're not paying Jonathan Taylor a lot of money. And again, I'm not saying that David Montgomery is as good as Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor, when he's healthy, is elite. But they're they're just not valuing the position. They're valuing other positions and they're going to they're going to do the the common thing. They're going to draft a guy later in the draft and drive him or ride him until his rookie contract is done. And then maybe bring in a low cost veteran to share reps. Like that's their move. That's what they're going to do. I don't expect Khalil Herbert to get be here long term either. So, like, why in the world do you think they would trade draft assets plus pay him? Like that just that just doesn't make any sense. And that's just absolutely lazy sports writing. Yeah, I I never took that seriously. Or even even considered it. I took seriously. The rumors with the Chiefs defensive tackle that I think there was, I, did I expect it to happen? No, but I thought there was at least enough of a sense there where you can you could say okay, I could see there being legit interest there. That is a different story. I mean, again, I don't think the Bears would give up. I don't think it's the money. I think it's with him. Chris Jones is what 29? 29, 29, yeah. I think it is the bears would probably want to do a three year deal with him and the compensation would represent a guy that they only wanted for three years. And I think it's just not working out there. There's definite interest that one. There's definite interest. Jonathan Taylor. There is no interest because the, the ask and price off the bat and the ask of the, from the team and the player, there's no interest. Boom. I mean, would, if the Colts were like, Listen, we're ju- we're trying to tear this down and be awful this year to get the number one overall pick, and we know Jonathan Taylor's not going to be here beyond this year. Bears doing you a solid. Give us a seventh round pick for Jonathan Taylor, and he's got to play on, you know, his rookie deal, and he's going to play on it. Then you go, uh, yeah, absolutely, we do that. But that's not the case. Like you know, the Colts want a first. You know that he wants Jonathan Taylor wants a new contract. No, no interest is zero but chris jones is another story that one you have familiarity with the organization you have familiarity with the player it's a position that your head coach needs for this uh defense to work really well he's a excellent player then it's then you start going okay let me let me this may be in the reality of what do the the chiefs want for him if they feel they can't get him he's 29 it's late in the game you know can i pry him away with you know a a third and and if i can you know what what kind of money what kind of money does he want you know would he take a high high dollar contract but short years would he do something like that and you start working through that calculus because it's a better fit and that's that's why I agree with that one. Right, exactly. That's exactly my thoughts because there was just more logic to it when it comes down to it. Yeah. Now, do I think Jonathan Taylor is going to get traded? Uh, no, I think he'll play for the Colts this year or he'll partially sit out or whatever he does. And he, he'll stay with the Colts this year. I don't think they're going to move from him. I think it's a little too late in the game here, but, and as much as I hate this team, it would be really funny if the Eagles traded for Jonathan Taylor. And for the sole reason that their running back room would be Taylor Swift. 
No, no, for that, for that sole reason. That sole reason. That would be the only reason I would, I would root for that to happen. Is the the backfield of Taylor Swift. Um, that's fair. But uh, back to the game. Uh, what else do we got? Offensive line just was a hodgepodge. You had, you had like, what one starter in. Yeah, and you know, I I actually do think early on when Fields was in there, it held up okay. Um, I'm not saying it was gangbusters, but I thought it held up okay. But then as time went on, you, you kind of saw things, you know, collapse a little bit. But it's a real source of concern. I mean, the Tevin Jenkins injury, he's not going to be playing week one. And I mean, that right has, there. Has that, is been con- has that been confirmed? It sure seems like it. So... You know, is I heard week to week, and it's been almost a week, and we've we've got two weeks before game time, and we have not heard official injury report because they don't have to report anything until sometime the couple of days before game one. So what another week and a half before they have to report anything to the NFL. So right now it is they can be mum, they could be. They can dodge questions. And I heard he's in a walking boot, but we've seen plenty of, I mean, we saw, we saw uh, Patrick Mahomes in a walking boot, like two days before the Super Bowl, And that didn't stop him. And I'm not comparing them, but I'm just saying is that a walking boot doesn't mean end of the world. It, it's probably, you're probably right. He's probably not going to play week one, but I'm just saying we don't know anything definitively yet because other than him saying flu saying, Oh, it's, it's, it's a little more serious than day to day. I'll call it week to week. I mean, that could be a, a weak injury and, or maybe, you know, I, who knows? I don't know. And I don't want to speculate because I don't know. Um, But, you know, here's where we are with the offensive line. Braxton Jones seems healthy, and he's he's our left tackle. I think we're we're okay there, right? Yeah. All right. Right off the bat, left guard. Uh, I don't know the status of Tevin Jenkins. Um, Is Cody Whitehair going to be playing that position, or is he going to be healthy enough to be sender, or are you going to put – Jatire Carter, Jatire Carter there, and because they seem to really like him, they do, they do. And again, he was he was the other guy that worked out a lot with Olin Krutz in the off season. If you look at the pictures, he was the forgotten guy. Everyone was like, "Oh, Braxton Jones is doing it." Please He's don't turn Carter. into Sam Mustafa. <laughs> uh, but Carter, Carter went in there, and it was a. Uh, you're not seeing Olin ride or die with him, but he worked on getting stronger in his core and better center of balance and uh, and getting more functionally strong and, you know, learning better techniques. And he he you could tell like he was a guy that I liked in preseason and training camp last year. And I was like, this is a guy I think they can develop and he seems to be developing. So those seem to be your three options at left guard for week one. Um, I don't think Lucas Patrick is on this team by on week one. Yeah, we haven't really seen much. We have not seen anything. I, I think they could cut him. I don't think he's going to make this 53. I wouldn't be shocked if he didn't. And if he does, I would not be shocked if, because if you put a guy on injured reserve before your final cut down, he's done for the season. You can't have him be active. Right. So uh, it's a possibility. They put him on the the roster and, and then an hour later, or whatever the time limit, there's maybe it's the next day, whatever the time limit is, it's, you know, it's not very long. And then they put them on injured reserve after that. And then they've got four weeks or six weeks or whatever it is. Um, that's a possibility. 
But I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think he's going to make the squad really. So I think it's is white hairs snapping hand good enough to play. If not, I think it's Doug Kramer at center who has played pretty well. But isn't he hurt too? So I'm hearing, yeah, he, he was in a soft cast cast and left the game, but I'm hearing he got his hand stepped on and it was, it was bloody. Okay. That's what I'm hearing. So it was a, it's not a structural issue. It is a, uh, it was a open wound from a spike. Um, and it's, he's going to be fine. Well, let's hope that's all it is. Um, but he's played well. So um, I I think those are your two, two center options. Uh, Nate Davis, is he injured? Is it, is, what's going on? Is he going to play week one? If not, does Carter play over there? You know, with the Nate Davis thing, hasn't there been, and maybe I'm overreading this or maybe it's not true, but I, I feel like I'm seeing some smoke about like, I don't know if I want to call it attitude issues, but motivation issues. I don't know if you've seen anything on that. So I, I alluded to this earlier is, so I heard a story and I don't know if it's true. So I'm going to put that out there is this could be full of malarkey. I have no idea is um, that he came in with the expectation that he was the starter and no matter what, and he got some loaf grades and he was, he got the note in his locker after practice that he had been loafing and he was pissed and he made it known he was pissed. So the coaching staff showed him, um, footage of Cody Whitehair and said, this is what we expect. This is how you did it. We called it a loaf. We need this performance. And he was very unhappy with that. And Eberflus took him out to dinner. They talked about expectations, the hits principle, where he thinks, why they brought him on this team. And, uh, and they went out a few times and he got to know him as a person and they talked about life and, and expectations and, and things. And, um, and Nate Davis got a better understanding of what the expectations were of him and how they want him to practice and play. And, uh, and that there's that things are on much better terms um so if that's if any of that is true it makes you look at Eberflus and say man that guy that guy has sort of figured things out he knows how to deal with players he knows how to, to handle those things you know that's a big part of being a good head coach is it's not all the x's and o's per se it is You've got coordinators that you know, you've got a defensive coordinator, you've got a defensive line coach, you've got defensive backs coach and linebackers coach and quality control coaches. You know, you're not necessarily calling day to day plays, you're dealing with the team and players and getting everybody to buy into the the culture that you're building in that locker room. And so if that's the case and that's how he, he's dealing with it and and he's finding ways to make to make things work in otherwise tough situations, that makes me feel good about Flus. Sure. Mm -hmm. Now I'm fingers crossed, Nate Davis is ready on week one. Um, if not, you know, maybe Carter's over there. And then right tackle, I'm hearing that. Darnell Wright's going to be fine. Um, so that seems like it's a lock at the right tackle. But there's a lot of questions in that center of that offensive line that, you know, maybe in two weeks they've all resolved themselves. But as of we're recording this on August 27th, and that is that has there's a lot of question marks. Two weeks, two weeks before the season, I have a lot of questions. Yeah, I do too. I do too. And I, I don't, 
I, I want to keep hammering this home. I don't want to say, oh, from what I saw in preseason, you know, everything's automatically going to turn out like this, this, and this. That's not what really happens. I just, I think there's, there's validity in pointing out certain concerns that we have because, you know, there, there are legitimate concerns that we have. And, you know, I don't want to over or estimate, underestimate any of them really. Right. Absolutely. And offensive line is a, um, I've heard it described as, uh, you know, uh, Dan- the dance of the elephants where, you know, you, it's, it's not just about, um, you know, being able to bull rush or, you know, block a, somebody that's bull rushing you or individual play. It's, it is knowing what the guy on either side of you is doing, your expectations, your roles, calling, you know, understanding where you need to block, where you need to help and being able to maneuver in that that line with somebody and that just takes time and reps and that's why you see the lines that stay healthy are the ones that are that perform the best they're not maybe not necessarily the best players but they're healthy they're playing together and you see them start to gel and the bears right off the bat just aren't are already struggling in that area so it is you know guys are gonna have to gel quickly and it might be yep. a it might be a thing where if sure maybe guys are end up being healthy and this works itself out, but it's it's going to take a few weeks before at least before you really see them performing at their best. And where you're going to see that is can they open up consistent holes in the run game? Hmm. Yep. Um. What else? Uh, Tyreek Stevenson. Had a man that guy had a, a a whole season in one game on that <laughs> against the Bills, the highs of highs and lows and low of lows. Uh, yeah, I, I think discipline is definitely going to be growing pains with him. And, you know, he's just very physical and very aggressive, and you know, there's going to be games where we're we're going to have to as Bears fans, we are going to have to live with a, a lot of understanding with him as you know we we didn't do a good job as fans of you know growing with uh kyler gordon we right off the bat shit all over that guy whenever he had struggles and um look at the adjustments he made throughout last season yeah by the end of the year he was playing really well and i think tyreek stevenson you're going to see a lot more potential from him early, but I think you're going to see a lot of, I don't know if you're going to see a lot of loan coverages. I think you're going to see a lot of PIs Mm -hmm. and, and illegal contacts and late hits and things that are just physical. And sometimes you're going to see a, you're going to have a game where refs swallow their whistle. And those are the games where he's going to eat the lunch of that wide receiver. Because if you let him be lay physical, like, you know, any game during the Tom Brady era that the, the Patriots played where they just let those cornerbacks molest wide receivers. Like if if they have games like that, he is going to be all over. You saw what he did in the interception. He was all over that guy. And that was a clean play. But, you know, there's going to be plays like that where he's, uh, you know, he's f- handsing it up with that wide receiver and, and gets to play. And and on that, that interception was nice because he followed the guy and when he saw the wide receiver's eyes turn and look to the ball, that's when he turned to look and, and he got that interception it was nice. Yeah, it was, it was very good. You know, and I, stayed, stayed right in bounds with it too. I, I really like him. It's just, we are going to see quarterbacks go after him. Not week one. I don't think, I don't know if you're going to see, you know, Again, as much as they're, the Green Bay Packers are hyping up Jordan Love, I don't know if that coaching staff is going to right off the bat be like, yeah, we're we're going to trust him throwing against, you know, attacking a, you know, this a specific cornerback. I think they're going to they're going to scheme some things and, you know, but when they play 
they play the Chiefs. Yeah, Patrick Mahomes is gonna is gonna try to eat him alive. It, you know, the more established quarterbacks are gonna try to you know attack him, and you know he's gonna have to he's gonna have to learn quickly and to have a short memory and and get right back up there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Travis Gibson had a really nice preseason and training camp and it does not seem like he is going to be on the bears final roster. Yeah. Um, they've gave him permission to seek a trade. And honestly, I think there's, I don't, I don't know the possibility because the teams are going to be like, well, why would I trade for him? If I, if they're going to cut him, uh, especially when he is not a super established guy. Um, I think, I think teams are going to just kind of wait it out and, and see if, if they, uh, if they can just wait for him to get cut and then, and then try to sign him as a free agent. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if I would want to jump the gun on a player like that at this moment and yeah. potentially overpay. I mean, you're not, I mean, it's not like you're going to give up a lot to get him, but, but still, you know, there, if, if he was a little more established, there's, there's probably a good chance somebody would trade something for him because then you're like, well, I'm not competing with anybody else. I bring him in for a late pick and I know I have him and I feel confident with the guy, but I, I mean, is, you know, the most likely scenario where that would happen is a former coach, right? You know, he, he played for me. I like the guy. Can we get him? And that would be Vic Fangio. I don't know if the dolphins, are interested or not, but that would be, you know, a place where maybe he could wind up. Yeah, it's possible. Um, what other thoughts do you have about the game? Uh, well, Hunter looks good. That I sure. Um, <laughs> that's good. Uh, it, it, it's our, our kickoff return game. It's not what well, we had. We had the one good return. Oh, who was it that had that good return? Oh, it was Scott. Scott. Scott had a really nice return, but I just so much through this preseason. It's like we see these returns, these kick returns, and they're going to like the 18. Like they're not even making it quite to the 20. Valus Jones is going to be the kick returner. Yeah. He's. Uh... He's not going to be the punt returner. I don't know who's going to be the punt returner, but he's going to be the kick returner, and he's going to make this roster, um, especially since Dante Pettis got injured reserve, so he's done for the season. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, I don't know if I want Scott back there returning kickoffs the whole season because he's a little guy. He's going to get murdered. Like you watched him when he got hit, just flying, you know. So then he goes between their legs. <laughs> like the guy from the Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll see how things look. I think, I think Valus Jones is going to be the kick returner. And I think that's going to be fine. I think he's probably the best option you have as kick returner. And I think punt return is going to, I think that's probably still being debated. And, you know, I think that's where we're going to see uh, who wins on this because, um, you know, the, uh, the, you know, you have the special teams coordinator and your offensive coordinator, head coach, your general manager, probably vying and having different ideas of what the end of that roster is going to look like. Um, you know, you have, I'm sure the special teams coordinator is wanting, um, you know, Travis Homer to make this team and uh, Jalen Jones to make this team. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe he's trying to vie for somebody like Simba Webster to be, to make this team as a punt returner. You know, we, we don't know, but then it's, the the general manager and the offensive coordinator will be like, we don't want Simba Webster on this team. We want somebody that's, you know, somebody better as a as a as a wide receiver. So 
it's we're going to see how this team feels on Tuesday when they make the final roster cutdowns and um, we'll have a better idea of what their expectation is at punt returner. Yeah, and I'm also curious when that time comes when we get to see the injury report. Because, I, I mean, because I, I know they can't make anything official, but it just sounds like from everything we hear that we're not going to see Tevin Jenkins in week one. But I, we'll see, I guess. Who knows? Uh, who knows? Um, but the, we, I mean, we may see him go on injured reserve. We have no idea. It is, it is such a, uh, a unknown right now because, you know, Jaquan Brisker hasn't been out there, but I, I know he's going to be playing week one. You know, you, you know, Mooney and Claypool are going to be playing week one, but we haven't seen them. We, we didn't, you know, how much of this is just right. gamesmanship or how much is it? Let's keep our guys healthy. Um, at some point you just got to play the guys. Right. Yeah. Is, is, you know, it's all f- fun and fine to be like secretive about stuff. But at the end of the day, guys, uh, teams are going to have to film on you after a certain point, And you just got to be bigger and better and better than the other teams and to win the games. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there is one more thing I want to mention before uh, we we move on from the game is one thing that I do really feel good about is just having DJ Moore on this team because that one catch that he made where he could have easily been tackled for a short game, but then he used that physicalness and the acceleration to get plenty more yards. And if that throw was a little more to the other side of him where he could have caught it in stride, that could have been even bigger. So my whole point being is if there's something really to feel good about this offense, I'm feeling pretty damn good about DJ Moore. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I I think, I think we're going to see this offense at some point gel and play well. It just might take a few weeks before we see it in its final form. And Luke Getze is going to have to be prepared with game plans and then, backup game plans for when things aren't working of, you know, what, what can we do to simplify this or take a step back and be prepared for that? Because uh, last year it took him way too long to be able to change up things to, to make that offense uh, more um, ready to play on Sundays. Mm -hmm. And, And you have a lot better players on offense this year, but Again, your offensive line isn't hasn't played together. They need to play in gel. And, you know, sure, there's other teams that have more catastrophic injuries, but the Bears have a lot of injuries. So you're getting guys healthy, trying to get them gelled. You're trying to uh, work in wide receivers that haven't played in a while. And um, you're right off the bat playing a really good defense. That's your biggest competitor you know the hope is that a uh, justin field's legs are going to be the x factor in that game and open things up a little bit and force force the the packers to switch up what they're doing um but you know who knows it is it, the nfl is a weird game yes it is yes it is so that's why you know these concerns can all be legit, could be a mix, or some of the things that we were concerned about, might it, it might all be moot in the regular season. So after seeing the high of highs in the preseason and the low of lows preseason, how are you feeling overall about your the outlook of the full regular season? Uh, I, I think that we're still, I, I I think we're still further away from being legit than we want to believe. Um, you know, and again, you know, some of this is recency bias watching the preseason. Some of it is just looking at the roster construction. Um, yeah, I, I, I still see a defense that is going to struggle to get off the field. It should I, be better than last year, but I think they're going to struggle to get off the field. It should be better than last year. I still think against certain teams, they're going to have trouble stopping the run. 
Yeah, I mean that's a big one. Um, I just also just I'm gonna flat out say I need Justin Fields to be better. Yeah, that's just that's just the facts. We need him to be better. We need him to be smarter, and I think he's a very smart guy. But when you're on an NFL field and NFL action, you could have all the IQ in the world, but when the I, pressure is on, you gotta you gotta execute. And you know, I I still worry about Justin Fields taking too long to develop plays. I'm still very worried about that. I think things are going to get better solely for the last year. He waited a long, long time for plays to develop because plays weren't developing. They was just wide receivers weren't getting open. And um, I think with better receivers and we're going to see, uh, and we're going to see him learn to use his backs as a, as a safety valve. That's not there off that down there dump it off i think i'm thinking and hoping we're going to see more of that um but i really just want him to go out there and play with confidence because when he's and we saw last year is when he would have a game where he would break off a big run after that run things he threw better yes and i think he just needs confidence and i hope i hope luke getsy goes out there and I don't want to start off against the Packers by going, Oh, we need to build him confidence with conservative play calling. I don't think that's the answer. I think, Uh. I think, I think you start that off with, uh, you know, that's, you know, a nice screen and, uh, or, you know, some play to Cole Komet to get him open and an easy throw, um, something to, to get him to get, the Packers on their heels and Justin Fields feeling confident um, right off the bat, because otherwise if you're just, if you, when that offense stagnates, he starts to stagnate. And I think you, if you go out there and, and run twice and then have him on a third and seven on the first, you know, first series, you're like, all right, we're already setting ourselves up for a punt. Yeah, and I I just I hope that this team is prepared to execute a lot of those short screen plays and Justin Fields is able to get those balls off because I, I think they're going to be bringing the blitz a lot in week 1. I I think they're going to be blitzing quite a bit and they I just I just hope they're ready for that. And, and you know, the other thing with Justin Fields too is I know it's preseason I know, but gotta be more accurate. Yep. Just flat out has to be more accurate. Yep. And and, 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 and listen, and a lot of that is, I think, timing is because you know if you are throwing to guy A versus guy B, is they cut, they make their cuts different, they run the route slightly different. There's different speeds, and you have to work with those guys because to know the timing of where those throws go and you know you haven't worked with a lot of these guys because of injuries and and not playing in the in the the preseason as much because a lot of those things are just timing and you're like oh i threw it a little behind i was and you you go back in reality you're like man i was not expecting him to be at that spot that fast or uh you know but you just you got to get better at that. You're right, absolutely. But I'm still sticking with my. I think the Bears win about eight or nine games. Yeah, I'm thinking six or seven, but I I hope it's closer to you. Uh, I there, there's there's a part of me that, honest to God, wishes that we got that Tampa Bay game week one. But yeah, we don't. That, that would be nice. That would be nice because that team is that team is going to be a disaster, and you get that under your belt. Um, but then, then again, is you know, does it is it benefits you if 
you're going to play a tough team the first week because then you're like, all right, I got it out of the way. And we, we, uh, you know, if we were going to lose, we already lost. Whereas if you, if you go out there and lay an egg opening week, struggling against a, a bad team, you want to play those teams when you're cooking, just burn mm-hmm. right through them. Yep. Um, you know, so everybody expects the bears to lose against the Packers anyway. So it's, um, you know, it, it, it's if they lose, well, that just kept on going. Um, you know, then then give us give us Tampa later on, and when they're still a garbage team, and and we're figuring things out. I just wish the Tampa game was here instead of Tampa, because it's still early enough in the season where that's going to be hot in Florida. Yeah. Yes, it will be. And you know, I think it's a lot easier to play football in the cold than the hot. Though, at least the Bears, you know, they've been practicing here all summer, so it's not like they haven't had football activities in the heat. Different heat. (laughs) It's true. That's true. That that, that Tampa heat hits you different. That is is true. That, That point well taken. Um... All right. Anything else you want to talk about football or should we move on to baseball? Let's move on to baseball. Uh, before we talk Cubs and Sox, I don't know if you're familiar with ImmaculateGrid.com. Oh, yes, absolutely. It's it's the latest rage. Uh, do you play it at all? I need to. I keep meaning to. I just never get around to it, but uh, I definitely need to. I would like to play around on the air while we're talking, the two of oh, us. Oh, hell yeah. I, Let's go. Let's go. Is I didn't do to, I did NFL one today. Um and uh, I did pretty well. I got an eight of nine. I couldn't think of a player that played on both the Falcons and the Chargers, but I did pretty well. Baseball, I haven't started, but I looked at it. So the the three columns are White Sox, Mariners, 20-plus win season pitching. Okay. And the rows are Giants, Mets, Yankees. Okay, so Sox, Giants, Connor Gillespie. I was going to say Johnny Cueto. Oh, that, that's a good one, too. So Johnny Cueto. Uh, uh, uh. All right. Do you want to go continue down the Sox column? Or sure. Do... Sox, Mets. Uh, the catcher. Um... Bobby, Bobby Bonilla. Oh, I was going to say... Uh... McCann, but okay. Oh yeah, James McCann. James McCann, yeah. Um, I, I was gonna go Bobby Bonilla, but yeah, James McCann got him two for two. Um, Mets and White Sox. Didn't we just do Mets? I'm sorry, Yankees. Yankees and White Sox. Yankees, White Sox. Uh, David Wells. Yeah, I was gonna say Jim Abbott, but yeah, let's go David Wells. David Wells. Two percent of people put J- David Wells. All right. Um, what about, should we go down the, the Mariners column? Sure. All right. Mariners, Giants. Mariners, Giants. Mariners, Giants. Uh, Dave, Dave Henderson. This is, this is where my, my baseball card collection has been invaluable. Eh, this game eh, is, eh. is I have these old baseball cards where guys have long completed their careers and you're like, Oh yeah, that guy. I'm, I'm almost positive that Dave Henderson played one season for, um, uh, for the giants. Well, that's, that's one you could think of. All right. Dave Henderson. Yes, and only zero point three percent of people pick Dave Henderson. Boom! <laughs> it's funny, you know who the, uh, you know who the you know plays this game. It's a lot of younger people because um, when I put when I put these old timey players from my youth on there, they uh, you know you don't have a ton of people um, picking them. Of course. All right, Mariners Mets. I was going to say Paxton, but that was Yankees. Um, 
Mariners Mets. Oh, uh, Cano, Robinson Cano. All right. Robinson Cano. Yep. 29% picked him. Yeah, I bet that was a fairly common one. All right. Now, uh, Yankees and the Mariners. John Paxson, or James Paxson, that pitcher, Paxson. 4% of people. All right. All right, here we go. 20-plus game uh, win season pitching Giants. I'm going to go with a layup here. Christy Mathewson. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Trying to think if they're right. Cause mad bum never won 20 games with them. No, I don't think Lincecum did either. I don't. Yeah. I mean, it's when you're talking modern day wins aren't, you know, I, I don't think, I don't think the giants have had any recent 20 game winners. I think they're going to be all older players. Probably. Yeah. We got Christy Mathewson. All right. Um, what about the Mets? Doc Gooden? Yeah, I was going to say Doc Gooden or... Um, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure Doc Gooden won 20 games. I I, th- I thought he did. All right, let's see. Dwight Gooden. Yep. 30% of people. All Probably right, in the 80s sometime. Uh, 20 plus win season Yankees. Did Musina ever win 20? I don't. I'm sh- probably, but Andy Pettit, I'm sure did. What about Whitey Ford? <laughs> do you want to do Whitey Ford or do you want to go with Andy Pettit? Uh, I kind of want to go with Whitey Ford. All right. Whitey Ford. Yes. Whitey Ford. I mean, the Ford. guys in the the guys in the Hall of Fame. So you, you got to figure. All right. Let's see what our options were. There were 34 players that could have worked for the Yankees in that. CeCe Sabathia, mm-hmm. Mike Mussina, mm-hmm. Andy Pettit, Roger Clemens, David Cohn, uh, Ron Guidry, Tommy John, Ed Figueroa, um, Catfish Hunter. Uh, Fritz Peterson, Mel Stottlemyer, Jim Bouton, Whitey Ford, Ralph Terry, Bob Turley, Bob Grimm, Allie Reynolds, Eddie Lopat, Vic Rashi, Spud Chandler. I don't know who the hell that is. Um, Tiny Bonham, Red Ruffing, Lefty Gomez. I don't know. Sounds like you're making up names after a while. <laughs> uh, Hingle McCringleberry. <laughs> yeah, wait, wait, Hoyt, George Pipgrass, Herb <laughs> Pennock, Sad Sam Jones. <laughs> These are real people. Carl Mays, Bob Shockey, Bullet Joe Bush, Russ Ford, Al Orth, Jack Chesbro, Jack Powell. I mean, it's funny because you start off that list. You're like, okay, Roger Clemens, slam dunk. Moose did win 20 plus games. Yeah. And David Pennant Cone. won 20 plus games. David Cohn, Whitey Ford. C- we like, forgot about CC Sabathia. And CC Sabathia, yeah. It's like, yeah. okay, yeah, those all make sense. And then you get into Johnny Chaw spitting McGee, and you're like, what? Uh, and then you're like, you know, Revolver Jones. And you're like, what? That's not a guy. That's not a name. <laughs> like, you know, the old, the old bullet Joe Bush won 26 games in 1922. Jeez. Sad Sam Jones won 21 and 23. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then I know you mentioned Catfish Hunter. I know Catfish won some uh, World Series with the Yankees, but when I think of Catfish He's, Hunter, yeah, I, he, I think of the A's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the 20 plus win seasons for are the Giants. Man, there's a lot of them, but they go back. John Burkett, Bill Swift, Mike Krucko, Ron Bryant, Gaylord Perry, Juan Marichal, Mike McCormick, um, Sam Jones, John Antonelli, Larry Jansen. So I think we are. We, you know, we had our choices of like Carl Hubbard, Hubble and uh christy matthewson <laughs> those were the those were our best bets like these old-timey guys 
Like the most recent one they had was 93 before you were born. Yeah. Yep. One year before. And the Mets only had six. R.A. Dickey, Frank Viola, David Cohn, Dwight Gooden, Jerry Kuzman, and Tom Seaver. Hmm. Oof. We, we did it, though. Yeah. All nine. Cool. All right. All right. Cubs. This this stretch against uh you know the lower tier player teams, we were like bare minimum, they have to go eight and four. Bare minimum. What do they do? Eight and four. Eight and four. And it took it took taking three of four from the pirates to do it. Um, you know, not necessarily their best run. I mean, they had some really good games in this stretch, but not their best run. And I'm hoping you know, I'm, I'm going to chalk a lot of it up to there was some sad starting pitching in there in some instances. And I'm hoping we're starting to figure that out. Uh, Assad is pitching really well. Looks great again today. He went seven innings. Um, is my dog barking. Uh, it, Jordan Wicks came up, pitched really well. That was awesome. I w- struck out nine guys and then. First inning, he gives up a home run, then the next two reach. And you're thinking, oh, God, this is going to be a disaster. Tommy Hadovy goes out to the mound, and then he strikes out like the next four or five hitters, and he retires everyone beyond that. I mean, that changeup was doing things. Like, that wasn't some fluky just, oh, he changed speed. That thing was diving and dipping. That, That had some funky spin on it. That was sick. What a huge... Huge debut for him. I mean, you have to feel really good after that. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, because you had you had to be really worried. I mean, as fans, we are. But as the team, because you're like, Smiley's done. He's cooked. He can't. Yeah, he, you, he can't that, that start is not a, a starting pitcher right now. No, he cannot start another game for this team. And God knows where when Stroman's coming back. I don't think he's coming back. I don't think we see him again this year. I really don't. I mean, ribs should be. They should be a couple weeks. Like, I, I didn't even break ribs. Like, what the hell happened? Well, and I mean, that's or he cartilage. just doesn't want to play anymore. It, it's cartilage too. So not only does it have to heal, but you actually have to feel good again. It's it's one of those things where you can't even like breathe properly, and it hurts like hell. Yeah, I've broken ribs before. It sucks. Um, you know, the the worry with that is the is it hurts. So you do shallow breaths and you can get develop build up fluid in your lungs and that's back in the olden days when you break ribs they would wrap they would wrap your rib cage with tight bandage to kind of compress everything so it could heal and now they do not do that they just say suck it up and they give you things for the pain because they want you to breathe because it's way worse to get fluid in your lungs than it is the way, the yeah pain of, of broken ribs the way i see it i, I don't even consider Strowman a factor at this point not I, even but it was, I mean, it was wild because it. we were expecting him to come and pitch and then they're like oh yeah no he's he messed up his ribs yeah Dude, uh-huh. what what the hell happened yeah um so that was a big blow and you know at this point now it's you know Ty- tyone's gotta put his big boy pants on and you know we are gonna have to count on Assad and and Jordan Wicks and to come in and 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 play meaningful baseball games because yeah. we were we were expecting with the Brewers playing a tough stretch and us playing a bad stretch to catch up a few games and then the Brewers nope. the Brewers win eight in a row and just crush all of those tough opponents that's that that was a blow that was a big blow for the Cubs and who do we get to play next the Brewers. And did you see the matchups, the probables? I did. So if you, for the listeners, if you haven't looked, uh, game one, Jamison Tyone versus Wade Miley. Then game two, uh, Steele versus Corbin Burns. And then game three, Hendricks versus Brandon Woodruff. So we are getting a team that is kicking everyone's ass, and we get their two – two games against their best pitcher or with their best pitchers. That second game is going to be a, that's going to be a good game. If you like 
bad o- or no offense. In, in pitching matchup wise, yes. Um, yeah. If you if you want to see runs scored, you may want to turn on a different game. You never know, though. Baseball's yeah, weird. Baseball weird. It's you know you get a a warm game with the wind blowing out. Pop ups just go out. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know weather's going to be favorable. So I look. Right now, to be honest with you, I've kind of gone into being more concerned about wild card mode because even if the Cubs do like win a series here against the Brewers, say you win two or three, you're still going to be down three games. And it's not that that's an insurmountable lead, but I mean, no, it's not. But the Brewers just they just can't do wrong right now. And the Brewers always for the past under under Craig Council over the past several years have played some of their best baseball in August and September. Right now they just look like a team that is not going to slow down. But if the Cubs really want to have a division title, you are just gonna flat out gonna have to take it from them because they are not gonna give it to you. No, they're not. You're gonna have to win it. This is not this is not a team that's gonna you know I, I know their flaws. They, this team is has absolutely has flaws, and I don't think the Brewers have much shot to win a World Series. But as far as the division goes, they've got a, they've they've got it, you know, it's theirs to lose. And if the Cubs want it, the Brewers aren't going to fade away and let them no. have it, kind of like the Cincinnati did or like Pittsburgh did. Like those two teams were like, well, man, and. You know, Cincinnati's still a good team, but they've they've fallen back to earth. I don't think and the Brewers are they're not gonna, you know, keep winning these crazy number of games in a row, but they're gonna play well enough that if the Cubs want to win this division, they're gonna have to go on an eight game winning streak or ten yes, game winning streak exactly. to, to to catch up. It's not like the the Brewers are gonna suddenly lose eight in a row and and the Cubs are going to backdoor their way into this division. This yeah, is not, you can't count. You can't count on that. This their is pitching a, is too good. Yeah, their their pitching will keep them in it. But you you, you look at the wild card. You kind of get a better picture. Is there's three wild card teams, and the Phillies I think have a stranglehold on that top wild card spot. Mm-hmm. They're playing good baseball, and the only reason they're not competitive for a division is the Braves are just miles ahead. Yeah, they're they're you know boating teams. Um, but I think the Phils have a, a ch- chokehold on that top spot. So really there's the second, third wild card spots and there's two teams or two pl- spots and five teams competing for those two spots. For me, I think the ideal, if you're not going to win the division, I'd really like that second wild card. You'd have and- to face Philly, but you know what? If you get the third wild card, guess who you have to play in the first round? Well, is is that how the the bracket is working this year? Is um, I go on, let's see, uh, MLB because okay, uh, rounds because the first two seeds get buys, right? Um, so that's going to be is unless something crazy happens, it's going to be the Dodgers and the Braves, right? So then the third seed is the final division winner. If it was today, that would be Milwaukee. Uh, so three plays six. Okay. Uh, let's see. Mm-mm-mm-mm. So let's see. Six plays three, five plays four. Right. So if we're right. if we okay, ended up so as the final wild card, we'd have to go to Milwaukee to play the Brewers. You're right. You're right. Um, and I don't think that they have a great. I mean, you never say never, but Milwaukee's got to be a heavy favorite with that pitching. Oh yeah, you don't want to you don't want to go against Milwaukee. It just, I mean, whenever you play a division opponent in the playoffs, it's always logic is out the window because you've played each other a lot, you know each other. Um, I mean, the 2015 Cubs beat the Pirates in the wild card round and the Cardinals in the division round, so you can't say you can't win it. But I, I just, I, I don't, I wouldn't feel good about playing Milwaukee in the first round. I, I wouldn't exactly feel amazing about playing the Phillies in the first round, but you know, if your pitching kind of catches them cold, I think you can at least get some runs off the Phillies pitching. So 
I, I feel like there's a slightly better chance to beat Philly than Milwaukee, but you know, never say never with either. So, you, you know, there's always that hangover. Right. Um. So, yeah. The, so the Phillies, I think have a stranglehold. And then right now it's the Cubs in that second wildcard spot and Arizona in the third and followed by Cincinnati, San Francisco, Miami. I don't know if Miami has the horses to to hang in this race. And I don't know if I mean I don't know. I don't I think the Arizona, Cubs have I think Cubs Arizona have seven buddy, games against Arizona. That's big. That is big. That's um but I, I think Cincinnati might hang around. I don't know if they make it, but I think they hang around. Yeah, I don't think they're going to roll over and die. I really don't. It would be fun if, you know, it's the the divisions are Dodgers, uh, uh, I was going to say Falcons, the uh, Braves, the Brewers, and the wild cards are the Phillies, the Cubs, and the Reds. And Reds played the Brewers in round one. Mm-hmm. That would be a fun series. That would be I, really fun. Because there would be, you know, the strength versus strength that that just absolute masher lineup versus the pitching. That would be fun. That That really would. would, And it's possible. It's very possible. It's very possible. I, you know, I don't want Arizona to make it. They're a good baseball team. It's just they're I don't know. Is that are they exciting? Corbin Carroll is pretty exciting, but that's that's about it. I would much rather see Cincinnati. And have the world get introduced to some of those players. I just wouldn't want to deal with them in a potential playoff matchup. But would you though? Like, what? Well, let's see what happens after. Um, so, dun, 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 dun. so if the Cubs, they were they would be the five seed in that, and they would play Phillies. Then they would go on to play the Braves. So the soonest that they could they could see the reds would be in the the, the NLCS the NLCS. And at that point we're playing with both teams are playing with house money. Cause neither one should be there. Right. Right. Like if, if, if the Cubs, if the Cubs could beat the Phillies and the Braves, like I'm chalking this season up as a victory, regardless of what happens in that division series or in the championship series. Frankly, I just, uh, at this point, if they just make it, I'm chalking it up as a win. I would still like to see them be competitive in a series. I just, uh, yeah, but if they just get there, wouldn't you say that's accomplishing a bit with where they're at? Yeah, I mean, I just, if they make it, I'm happy. I would just like to see them be competitive, even if they don't win. If yeah, they get swept, win a if game they, at least. If, yeah. yeah, if they get swept, that's that's a bummer. Um, but I mean, we're seeing a team that they've got something. It's I don't know how to describe it. They've got something. Even when the chips seem down, they've got something. And you know, Jan Gomes. Seems like he's this year's David Ross. Yeah, it does feel that way. But playing at a, I mean, he's getting clutch hits left and right. I mean, statistics wise, if you look at him straight on paper, like he's just same guy. He's just a, he's literally average catcher. But he's coming up when you need him and they don't need him to be the man playing because Miguel Amaya is playing pretty well. And so you've got two guys and, you know, them jettisoning Tucker Barnhart was a a blessing because it gives Amaya and Gomes more opportunity to play. And, um, and the, the Cubs are going well with those two catchers. Think about it now. We we've, we think of the guys that we've jettisoned and it's like, you know, we've really kind of trimmed it down to where we want an optimized roster to be because really what I I think the thing that fans would want to see that's left is bringing up PCA. But outside that, it's like, you know, 
Tucker Barnhart, you didn't need anymore because you don't really need a personal catcher for a pitcher who's now hurt and probably not coming back with Stroman. Um, obviously, Mancini and Hosmer struggled, so they haven't been. And you know what else is nice? Is they have Miles Mastroboni on the roster only to be a 26th man because that's the only way you should be using him is as a 26th man. If I was about 26... to say, I was about to say the one thing I would like is for him to be DFA too, um, because I would rather have that 26th man be somebody that could do something. And he has been abysmal and he is, you know, he's been abysmal this season. I, I want to see that changed come September, but I think for the time being over the it's, past week or September... so, September, on later this week. I, I I get it. I get it. But <laughs> for the past week or so, having Miles Master Bowen, he's a 26 man and using him in very light situations, I, I can live with that. What I'm just glad that he's not getting starts every other day. Yeah, he cannot he cannot regular start. He cannot he shouldn't even start period. No. And, it, for late defense or pinch running, yes, but not starting. Yeah. If David Ross like Literally, we should send John Lackey on Buttercup into there to joust uh, David Ross if he tries to make Master Boney a starter in any game. <laughs> he, this The minute David Ross pencils it in, he hears outside his, outside his office and then and a he, snort. And he knows exactly what that means because he's played with Lackey. He goes, oh, shit. He's like, oh, <laughs> damn it. And then <laughs> he hears it stop. Then clank, 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 or the spurs and the door opens. <laughs> he's, oh my God, he's wearing David or uh, John Lackey is wearing a uh, one of those giant buckets that they put the the gum in, and he's wearing that on his head with two holes <laughs> drilled in for eyes. And he's got the he's got the the handle for the bucket down around his chin. <laughs> you just hear you, you see him walk, and you hear the spurs clinking. Oh <laughs> uh, God. But yeah, Master Boney can't start. This team plays so much better when he's not starting. Um and, you know, it's it's funny with this team right now, is because there's been some notable slumps over this period. It, you're just you're really fortunate that this this is best case scenario that I hope for. I hope that a number of these slumps are just coming during that bad time, you know, that the easy schedule time where you could say, okay, a number of our players are slumping, but we can still get away with it and go eight and four because we were playing subpar opponents. And then maybe once we get into September, these crucial games, uh, y- you see some of these guys heat up again, because let's just be honest. Dansby Swanson has been in a bit of a slump the past few weeks. Uh, he, you know, it's, he has, but when he's gotten hits, they've been timely hits. Yeah, and I'm not worried about him or anything. It's just a matter of the fact that he's in a little bit of a funk right now. And you could say the same thing about Mike Talkman. You could say the same thing about Christopher Morrell. He's been in quite a funk. I mean, really, he's got like just a pair of hits, including the walk off against the Sox. But, you know, uh, you know, other than that, he's been in a bit of a slump. But I think that uh, if you can hopefully get some of those guys warming up again, for the crucial games, you got to feel good about that. So let's just hope that that's the case. Yeah, but you're at least you're building your your roster construction and your batting order much better. I agree. Absolutely. And it's really nice to see Seiya Suzuki swing well again. Seiya Suzuki starting, you know, having Bellinger be your cleanup guy makes a lot of sense. Bellinger uh, is just stupid right now. It's he's just going up there every time there's guys on, he finds grass. I can't remember the last time. I can't remember the last time I felt as good as I have with Bellinger up in a guy in scoring position where I felt confident that he was going to find grass. He does. It's it's great because he's got 20 plus home run power. And yet when he needs to just go up there and be like a slappy hitter, he does it. I mean, you know, here's the thing is, is barring anything catastrophic, your NL MVP is probably going to be Mookie Betts or Ronald Acuna, right? Right, right. 
Um, Freddie Freeman may get some votes in there. Mm-hmm. But Cody Bellinger has a really good say in being that fourth guy in the voting. Sure. Uh, I mean, Matt Olson. Would have been an all-star if he didn't get hurt. Matt Olson, Bryce Harper uh, um, up there. But I, I would say, I would say that Cody Bellinger probably, maybe even third. I mean, you know. Matt Olson might get a little more love with the home runs. Maybe, maybe, um, but you know he get he might get over, over. Do you vote him with a teammate being better? He's not the best guy on his team. No, he's not. But I mean, I, I do feel like when you have the kind of season you're having power wise, when you're competing with Shohei Otani, that's going to get some love. Oh yeah, but it's I mean, maybe maybe that pulls votes away because it's hard to vote for you know, and you're voting for two guys on the same team. Right. Um, you know, so, uh, I, I, that's why I, if I was a betting man, I would be betting Mookie bets to win MVP. Um, I still give it slight to Acuna, but eh, Mookie's making a, making a case for himself. Um, I mean, still a good number of games left, but I, but, you know, my point is that Cody Bellinger's name is in that conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. He's certainly the Cubs MVP, no doubt. Oh, yeah. And that I still remember when Mully from Mully and Haw talked about how dumb the Cubs were, that they gave up, that they're paying um, both Bellinger and uh, my God, why am I breaking on his name? Um, that the Cubs DFA'd went to the, the Dodgers, uh, Jason Hayward. Um, they're paying both, and they're going to put up similar numbers because uh, uh, Jason's get going to the Dodgers, and they're going to fix his swing. And the Cubs are so stupid. And man, Bellinger is been a steal, steal. Which I did not expect anywhere near this good. No, my my expectations were pretty low, to be honest with you. But we talked holy about it. crap. My my expectations were probably a little higher, but they were not terrible. They were not this level higher, you know. Um, but he's been he has been great, and I really hope the Cubs lock him up because it seems like he likes playing here and things are going. Yep, well. yep. And I mean, I I will give this. You mentioned Jason Hayward. 97 games this year, 250, 338, 451, 789. So he's having a nice year. He's having Not a Cody nice... Bellinger anywhere, yeah. but it, it's a nice year. Yeah, he is. I mean, he's good. I'm glad. Uh, you know, he's – I'm I'm glad for him. He's a good guy. I, I don't yeah. hate him. I just – he the Cubs needed to move on from him. I 100%. There was zero debate about that. Yeah. And – now that he's off the books in a couple of weeks, the Cubs have now that money to to be able to throw the rest of it at Cody Bellinger because they're not throwing it at Shohei Otani, who uh, so sad to hear really is. Yeah. Yeah. I, that was I mean, honestly, that that always was a pipe dream. I don't think he was. I mean. Nothing will be set in stone until it happens, but I still don't think that the chances of him coming here were anything short of a of a <laughs> dream. Yeah. Um, I mean, and honestly, is as cool as it would be to have him, the money you're spending on him, it seems like that's a scary proposition because you're paying him to be a pitcher as well. And I don't know how long he's a pitcher. I, I give him maybe at most four more years. I think that's being generous. Um, is he may try, but I don't know what, how effective he's going to be. Um, so I, it's scary for me to, if he's going to get a long-term contract for that kind of money, because uh, that is going to, other than maybe like a Red Sox, a Yankees, a Mets, and a Dodgers, 
that's probably crippling any other team. Right. Absolutely. Because, I mean, look at the Yankees. They had um, Giancarlo Stanton that they're paying a shit ton of money for, and he has been a bust. And So many injuries. And they just pff, roll with it. They're going to they're not going to stop spending money. Um, let's see. Yeah. So this next week is the Cubs have three against Milwaukee in Chicago, and then they go to Cincinnati for four. It's a big week. That is a huge, it week. is, it is your, it is the, your number one rival who's leading your division. And then the team in your division, who's right on your heels for, for that wild card spot. So, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, if the Cubs, if the Cubs were to go on a tear right now, would be a good time to start because, you know, you could, you could erase that deficit in the division and start running away with the wild card, or you can be on the outside looking in, in the blink of an eye. At minimum, you hope they can just stay, stay afloat because Cincinnati's not going to go away and you have to play in their ballpark. And remember when we that place is a dominate that box. place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, oh, they, they, they can go off on you in that place. Yeah. You could be seeing some ugly, ugly pitching outings in there. I mean, th- it really is like a second course field. I mean, not to that level, but yeah, pretty different, damn close. Di- similar results, different reasoning of why, but yeah, yes, it is. Uh, it is it is a hitter's paradise there. That's going to be real tough. I just I is our pitching going to be able to contain that? I don't. Know. I I'm just my fingers are really crossed because I think this first game against Milwaukee is going to set the tone, and I think it's your most winnable game. Of Absolutely, and far and away the most winnable. And even that's like Tyone. I mean. He had that good stretch, and lately he's just been kind of meh. Not awful, not great, just meh. Yeah, so you're hoping that he pitches a good one and then Wade Miley falls apart um, because th- that second game, at, that is the potential to be a really, really good game for the pitching duel, but I don't like the matchup of Hendricks and Woodruff. No, I I don't either. That's I I don't is, either. Is, I don't. I mean, Hendricks hasn't been pitching terrible, but I he he's going to give up a few runs, and I I think you really got to sh- clamp down on that Brewers team if against ben, Brandon Woodruff because um, probably not, not going to score a lot. You're not going to score a lot on him. But hey, baseball September baseball is crazy. A lot can happen. True, especially at Wrigley, where you know the summer summer in Wrigley. That wind gets going. Yeah. No, it feels like they don't always... It feels like the Cubs... They don't always take advantage when the wind blows out. No, well, they don't got a lot of boppers. Now, you hope Cody Bellinger and, say, Suzuki can take advantage. They're the ones that can hit for power the most. Um, I Yeah, I mean... This is one of those things where I just try to enjoy this for what it is. We're playing relevant baseball, and I just want to be playing relevant baseball until the end. I don't want to go through a a horrific stretch over the next two weeks where then, okay, you you completely just bottom out and fall out of it. I just I want to keep staying in this as long as possible and hope that we can get something. Because, listen, I think there's a lot to like about this team. There is – you have Cody Bellinger playing at an MVP level – you have Nico Horner playing good baseball. Even with Dansby Swanson in a slump, he's overall had a good year and he's great defensively. I think you have real good mojo in this locker room with this team. There is a lot of good feelings and yeah. good vibes and a great culture with this team. Yeah. Uh, seeing Seiya Suzuki hit again well is really good. Seeing Justin Steele, what he's been able to do is really, really good. And, you know, at the same time, though, I listen, there's... This team is not complete. This is not the complete version of what this team is going to look like long term. And, you know, you're right now, I think you're good. You're not great. You're not Atlanta Braves level. You're not Dodgers level. You're not Astros level. You're nowhere near that level. But at least there's something there where you're giving yourself a chance and you feel like the arrow is just going to keep going up. Honestly, uh, is 
postseason baseball. It is about team chemistry and and you know the unsung heroes coming through and the Cubs are full of unsung heroes that it is just make that postseason and who knows what happens. It and fr- is- frankly, frankly, I'm not even thinking about the postseason. I just want to get in no matter what happens. Yeah, I just want to get there. That, that's what I'm saying. Just get there and then whatever happens, happens. You know, you've got you've got a fun group of uh, good players, not great players, but good players that that there's a good there's a good camaraderie there, good team chemistry and, you know, get to the postseason and let and then it's a reset. Everybody reboots. It doesn't matter how many, how many wins the Braves had because they're, they start fresh. Well, remember uh, last year, the Dodgers had what, like a hundred, almost like 110 wins, maybe more, whatever it was. They didn't get past. They, they lost. They were one and done. Yep. It happens a lot. It does. Sorry. And do I think it's good? Do I think no matter what happens, no matter what happens, is this a World Series team? No, it's not. But when you get to the big dance, you give yourself any sort of chance. And no matter what happens there, you could say, you know what? We got there. We can build on. This feels really good to build on. And I think that is just such an important takeaway with this team. Yep. Agreed. I like, like I said, what I just don't want to see happen is this bottom out over the next week or so. This Uh, is a test. Yep. We, we can't, we, we have to play our a game. You know, it, we've gone through a lot of tight, stressful games against bad teams, which, which happens. I'm, I'm not trying to be overly analytical on that, but we need our starting pitching to give us something solid because there are times where I feel like with our starting pitching, it just kind of goes out and we just hope it survives. And, you know, you, you know, want, I, I think, I think Smiley shitting the bed and Stroman going out with the injury, but what happened when it happened, it sucked because you would much rather have those guys pitching like they did early on in the season for you all season long, but happening when it did, if it's going to happen, it's kind of a blessing when it did, because it gave you the opportunity to figure things out and give guys time to, to figure out how this is all going to work out before the stretch run. Yeah. That's good. It's good that you were able to plug in a sod and see what he can do. And then, you know, potentially here you got, uh, you got Jordan Wicks maybe being something for you this year. I mean, if if those two can pitch the way that they have, and obviously Jordan Wicks has only pitched one game, but if you get that kind of stuff, then you definitely feel better. Because before, when you didn't have uh, Jordan Wicks up yet, and you still were kind of unsure about what uh, Assad can do from a starter standpoint, there was definitely plenty of worry because – you know, Kyle Hendricks is overall solid. He'll he'll keep you in the game, but when you have to face some of those tough offenses, for a guy that doesn't miss a lot of bats, uh, things can go south pretty quick. We saw it against the Braves, and it, like you said, the, the Drew Smiley thing, I mean, that, that was not a major league pitcher out there over the past few months. Yeah, he's been brutal, and it's I'm glad they pulled the plug on that. Um, let's wrap this up quick with the White Sox. I don't really want to talk baseball per se on the field baseball. We don't need uh, to. It's all the, the news is everywhere else. Yeah. Is Kenny Williams and Rick Hahn were fired during the season, which I was pretty shocked by. I was too. I I, I was that... sure that they were gonna they were gonna trot the, that combo back out for next year too. Well, even at the very least, I didn't expect it to happen when it did during the season. And the fact that it was both and the words effective immediately were put out there, it, the news being announced before their game that night, pretty surprising. Yeah. And then this rumor or the stories came out that Rick Hahn was trying to quit, 
but he was told that his contract would be enforced and he'd be barred from going to another team. Um, that's that kind of makes sense. That's the kind of feeling I got that he didn't want to be there anymore. Uh, I, and we are learning more and more that our suspicions were pretty much correct. And, you know, the thing is, the the rumored leading candidate for for the job is Chris Getz. Is if you put him in there, are you really changing anything? Because number one, Jerry's still there, and number two is you don't like the way things have been going. Why don't you do a complete reset and and bring in somebody outside? Not promote not Tony the, Larusa, the but like not not just next man up. Like I, it it boggles my mind. Is bring in somebody from the outside, Jerry. Just do the business aspect. Stay away from baseball operations. Back fuck up. Yeah, I mean, and those Bob Nightingale was pretty quick on those. I think that Bob was... Nightingale is is a is the a spokesperson for Jerry Ryan. He is. That's Jerry gives him the things, tells him what he wants written, and Bob Nightingale does it. And I mean, the thing is, is that there's a lot of different rumors and thoughts that Bob Nightingale has around baseball, where people are like, "Okay, it's Bob Nightingale. I don't trust that." But when it comes to the White Sox, they're pretty reliable. Yeah. I mean, he was the one reporting about Tony La Russa and what happened. They hired Tony La Russa. And who's reportedly back with the White Sox helping with this process? Oh, uh, Tony La Russa? Tony La Russa. Uh, it's like, it, can Sox fans be happy for two seconds? Because there was jubilation when they found out that Rick and Kenny were gone. And then they realized, oh, Jerry's still around. Listen to these rumors. And you know what? Maybe they do end up doing their due diligence. And maybe they do get more serious about looking for guys. But, you know, we ha- people were coming up with dream lists. I mean, the one that came up the most was bring Theo to the South Side. And I think that it's fair to say that if Theo were to come to the South Side, you need to sell him a stake in the team. Uh, so I don't know how yep. likely Theo coming here would be, but you could there's, still there's go none other chance. places. There's none chance because he would step in and say, I need 100% control of the baseball side of things, bare minimum, bare minimum. And Jerry would say, no. Because right. it, why, why would Theo go there? That is a recipe for disaster because, you know, you could be like, I have this plan in place and Jerry could walk in there and be like, nah, Tony LaRusso is our manager. And that's, just, what, that's what he did to Kenny and Rick. Yeah. And you know, so it's, why would, why would you want to do that to yourself? If you're somebody that thinks that you are a front office person that could really be successful, not somebody, I mean, if it's a different story, if you're somebody like, this is my one and only shot. If I get the white Sox. Uh, well, I don't think that I have the resume to get some to another team. This is my shot. Like I'm at a certain age and this is my one shot. All right, you take it. But if you feel like you're a rising star or somebody that's had success and trying to do it again, and you could get another job, the White Sox have to be at the absolute bottom of your, of your wish list. Well, it would be a big project. I mean, it would be a really big project. You want to build up that farm system. You want to rebuild morale. You want to find the right man. You know, there's a lot of work to do there. It's and... not so, I'm sorry not to interrupt, but it's not so much that, I mean, you're in a bad spot. Like you're, you're going to have to shed payroll. You're in, you're doing a rebuild. You have to build the farm system and the major league roster. And that is, and, and you have Jerry threatening to move the team. Uh, it's not, it's, it's ownership. Like, how do you do all the things that you want to do when you have a cheap owner that likes to step on your toes while you're trying to do your job? Which it, you get, you can't help but wonder if if they do. And, you know, I'm not going to say I'm not going to declare Chris gets the next GM until it happens. But 
if if Chris Getz is indeed the guy they want, I mean, doesn't it kind of make sense that uh, for from a Jerry standpoint, the way he wants to run things, that that's the way to go? Yeah, I mean, that's that would make sense. Is Chris Getz comes in, he knows how how it works, and he shuts up and plays ball and does things Jerry's way, and knows he has a job for twelve plus years. Right. Now, there was something I wanted to bring up again about Kenny Williams. Did you hear the Ryan McGuffey story? No. So, you know, he worked with Cap, right? Yeah. So he was talking, McGuffey was talking, I think on Cap's podcast, uh, about, like, who was in charge of the White Sox. Because we never really knew. And it enraged Kenny Williams, and he called Ryan McGuffey, and called Cap and Ryan McGuffey. He was telling Cap, tell that mother effer I'm in charge. And then at the ballpark the next day, Kenny Williams came up to Ryan McGuffey and let him have it. So everything we've heard between the story of the GM of the Marlins, uh, Kim, she was saying how she was talking with Kenny Williams for the Jake Berger trade Mm -hmm. and how apparently Rick Hahn didn't want to do the Jake Berger trade, but Kenny Williams did. Guess who gets... Final say, Kenny Williams. It's it, we're we're seeing here that our suspicions were correct. Where Rick, for most of this, or at least a good chunk of it, they, he was a puppet of Kenny Williams. Kenny Williams had the final say. I said it before. I said it again. Is that Kenny Williams was the GM, and Rick Hahn? Rick Hahn got a raise and a promotion to take the brunt of the media and fan criticisms of what was happening. Cause it it's was, clear. It's clear as day that he's kind of a soft little man. Kenny Williams, Kenny Williams wanted all of the, uh, the authority to do what he wanted to do without any of the, the face and consequences. of the media and consequences. Yeah. So that's what he did. He's, he got a patsy to, and, and Rick Hahn was his what assistant GM and then promoted mm-hmm. him to GM and it was like, here you go. This is your guy. But really, he ran the show and he just trotted Rick Hahn out there. And you'll never be able to tell me that that's not the case. That is, I I believe pa- it in my heart of hearts. I agree, too, because look at the pattern. I mean, obviously, the rebuild was the rebuild. OK, you traded away. You did all that, blah, blah, blah. OK, that was the rebuild. But you go back again and you remember how Kenny Williams ran the show. And you saw how Rick apparently ran the show over the past few years when they became contenders. It was a lot of dumpster diving and bringing in washed up players to try to be your solution. We saw it with Kenny Williams for how many years? You know, you had just even just after the World Series, you brought in what was left of Ken Griffey. You brought in Manny Ramirez. You brought in Ken Euclid. You brought in Andrew Jones. Uh, You brought in. Uh, uh, Jimmy Rollins, you brought in Matt Latos. Those were all classic Kenny Williams moves. And then over the past few years, what did you do? You got lucky with this move. It ended up working, but you brought in Johnny Cueto. You were going out and, you know, Dallas Keuchel looked like a good move at the time, but it turns out he was kind of washed up. But it's it, you just saw a lot of the classic Kenny Williams stuff. Yep. Yeah, so I mean, the fingerprints all over it, and you know, I, it's they both had to go, and I'm shocked the way it happened. But I, why I feel like it's going to be Chris Getz is because Kenny knows wants a guy that's going to come in and kiss the ring. Getz is there already. He knows how it works. He knows how things run. He's kissing the ring, and I don't think the White Sox want to pay the rest of the contract to Kenny and Rick and Pedro Grafal. He's going to want to keep Pedro. And, and if he brings in somebody external, that's a legit uh, general manager slash president of baseball operations, then they're probably going to want to bring their own guy in and not, not a guy that the, the previous people brought in one year ago and it didn't work. So, I, that's why I think that's why I think it's going to be gets they might they might bring in somebody outside to to be under him well yeah the the but, rumor was the guy that used to work with Chris Getz in Kansas City 
And it was with the Texas Rangers most recently. Um, I know you're talking about. I can't think of his name, but kind of a weirdo. Uh, but th- that's a possibility. But I do not think they will bring in an external person to take that lead job. Yeah, we'll see how it plays out. I I certainly would not be surprised if it ended up being, um. Chris gets. I, I'm not going to say it's 100% a guarantee, uh, what it, but it, what if it's Tony Larusa as the GM, as the as the president of baseball operation with Chris gets as the GM, God Emperor, all powerful, knowing Tony. <laughs> all just, employees must bow before the uh, the image of Tony before every every day. He's got a Jack and Coke with his feet up on the desk. You know, White Sox polo. Uh, I don't don't put it past. Don't put it past. It's uh, Jerry. Uh, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw. I'm gonna throw out a duo here, to run the White Sox organization, and and you're gonna hear it and you're gonna think it's the stupidest thing ever. And I then think you're gonna I know what you're and, gonna say. And then you're gonna think about it for 10 seconds and go, I hate it, but what that might happen. All right, I think I know where you're going, but let, let Tony let LaRussa hear. and Hawk Harrelson. Yep, yep, that's exact. I was gonna say Hawkaroo and Tony. <laughs> you're gonna be like, that's so stupid that that might happen. Didn't didn't Hawk when he was the GM in the mid 80s? I know he fired Tony LaRussa, but didn't he also have the fences moved back? Maybe. I, I don't Because our boys can hit it over. That how that would be such a Jerry move. I'm getting the band back together. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, oh my god. It it was quite a week for the Sox because, uh, you know, obviously that news came out and then, you know, obviously like the the team itself, the play doesn't matter. What's happening on the field doesn't matter at this point. I mean, you called up Corey Lee, which is, you know, you get a look at him and, uh, Luis Robert might hit 40 homers. So you hope he does that, but you know, that really doesn't matter. It's, it's everything else surrounding the team and, you know, the, the rumors of them moving, um, you know, obviously are a big story of this, too. And my whole thoughts on that are, I don't think they're leaving Chicagoland, but could I totally see Jerry trying to con his way into a sweet new deal? Of course. I just, I don't think that deal exists in 2023. I that, don't think so either, but he's going to try. He is, he is going to throw everything out there and... If and the reality is, if the city and the state are not going to give money to the Chicago Bears, why in the world would they give it to the White Sox? They said no to the Cubs. They said no to the Bears. Why would they say yes to the White Sox? Jerry, J- Jerry's Jerry's got nude photos of every politician, and oh, uh, and so you'd have Tommy or uh, Tony Larusa as your president. You'd have Hawk Harrelson as your GM and your assistant GM is Tom Pachorek. Oh dear. Hawk and Wimpy back together. Wimpy. <laughs> oh dear. Uh you know, I, I had a bull one bulls topic. I wanted to talk about Lonzo Ball, but let's save that for next week. Yeah, that sounds good. All right. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Nope. I think I've said my piece. All right, well, that's going to do it for this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. I want to thank everybody so much for listening. Please hit subscribe, however you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, Spotify, etc. Share this podcast with your friends. It's how we grow the show. Follow us on social media at Swirsky Sports, Facebook.com slash Swirsky Sports, Swirsky Sports.com, or Shy Fan Pat 2 for Alex on Twitter slash X, or uh, Alexander J. Pat Creative.com for all the cool stuff that Alex does. And again, thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. Cubs win! What a lucky break! The good Lord wants the Cubs to win! We thank Dick and God for all they have provided. Cubs!
Cubs win. Cubs win. Cubs win. Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like... Remember, New Yorkers, smoking crack is not legal on the planes. Bears, 31 to negative 7. The Bears. Oh, when the Bears go bearing down.